anyone in this room that can testify in the good times he's faithful and the bad times he's faithful when the storms come he's faithful come on somebody give the Lord praise today if he's brought you through a few things I believe there's some overcomers in this room this morning that know that God is who he says he is and the good news is no matter what you're going through no matter what you're facing this morning as you stand in this place on this Sunday morning you can be confident I love that that those words in that song that says my confidence that is my confidence Paul said in Philippians I am confident of this very thing he didn't say he said one thing he didn't say a lot of things I'm not confident what the weather's going to be like if you live in Mobile you know you can't you don't know if it's winter or summer sometimes it's both in the same day I don't I'm not confident I don't know what the stock market's going to look like I don't know what politics are going to look like but Paul said I am confident about this thing this one thing that he who has begun a good work in you is faithful he has fidelity he is faithful to complete that work amen God won't quit on you he's going to see you through amen let's give the Lord praise in this house this morning amen he's worthy it is so good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. If you have your Bibles, would you remain standing with me? Just grab your Bible. And I'm going to ask you today, uh, thank you, praise team. Awesome, awesome job today. They stepped up this morning and did an awesome job. Appreciate them so much and band and all of those involved. Zechariah chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading at verse 6. It'll be on the screen as well. If you're looking in your Bible, the best... Uh, uh, to find Zechariah, the best suggestion I have is go to Matthew. You know where Matthew is? Turn left, and you'll get there pretty quickly. Zechariah, and we're going to look at chapter 4, verse 6 through 10, and I'll go back and make reference to this passage of Scripture. Just before we read it, let me say very quickly, thank you for being here this morning. Doesn't this look great? This is a wonderful crowd, uh, and we've got you spaced out as much as we can. And uh, I hope somebody shows up next service, but we're glad you're here in this one. And uh, it's just a delight to see you in the house of the Lord and so thankful that you're here. We don't take it for granted. When I walk in and, and see you here, it just blesses my soul. And to look out and uh, to these cameras and know that there's people that are watching not only here in Mobile County at home who are being safe, but there are people literally watching around the world. We discovered that last week with some messages that we got of people who were watching. And I made a comment last week. I know there's a lot of ministers that they tell me they watch and you wouldn't believe the comments and text and those kind of things. You just never know who's watching. So we welcome all of you who are watching on the virtual campus. Can we welcome those that are watching online and wherever they're watching? Because there's people around the world that need Jesus, and this is an avenue for us to be able to give it to them. The Bible says in Zechariah 4, verse 6, Then he said to me, this is what the Lord says to you, Zerubbabel. It is, that's one of my favorite words in the Bible to say, by the way, Zerubbabel. Come on, say it with me, Zerubbabel. This is what the Lord says to Zerubbabel. It is not by force nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Nothing not even a mighty mountain will stand in Zerubbabel's way. It will become a level plain before him, and when Zerubbabel besets the final stone of the temple in place, the people will shout, may God bless it, may God bless it. Then another message came to me from the Lord. Zerubbabel is the one who laid the foundation of this temple, and he will complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of heaven's army has sent me. Do not despise these small beginnings. Somebody say those two words with me, small beginning. Do not despise these small beginnings. For the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. I want to speak this morning, and I'll, I'll share some more about that passage, and we'll quote it and read some of it again in a moment. But I want to talk today on the subject, small things, big difference. We're still in our refocus series that we're in all the way through the month of January on Sundays and Wednesdays. If you haven't been here on Wednesday, I encourage you to be here on Wednesday night because we're, we're going through this, this thought, this theme, this series of refocus. And today, as we begin this new year, and we're already halfway through the first month of the new year, 
I want us to continue to talk about how to get our focus, how to refocus on the things that matter. And today I want to talk about how small things make a big difference. Father, I thank you today for your word. I ask you to add your blessing to it. Anoint the speaking of the word. Anoint the hearing of the word. God, I'm thankful for everyone that you have assigned to be here in this service this morning. I don't believe we're here by accident, but we're here by divine providence. You have ordered our steps and you have brought us together for such a time as this. Lord, we may never be gathered just like this. We'll never be this same equation, the same people, the same group. But Lord, you brought us together this morning just like this for such a time as this. And I give you praise for what you'll accomplish today through your word. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And you may be seated today. Again, welcome to Oak Park Church. And uh, we just appreciate you being here this morning. I want to speak to you, as I said, on this thought, small things, big difference. And I don't know about you <clears throat> this morning, but there's something about this time of year that I really love because I always have this sense of optimism and faith that I'm going to do better. <laughs> and there's some things about my life and the lives of those that I love that, that, that I, could actually be different, could be better, could that I could, I could do a better job at. And so I don't, know, I don't know what it is. There's always this sense in the new year as the calendar changes that we can make a difference. So I don't know about you. Maybe some of you would like to, to get in better shape. Maybe you'd like to lose weight. Maybe you'd like to, to eat better. Maybe you want to be spiritually more spiritually focused. Maybe you want to read more of the Word this year. Maybe you want to increase in your prayer. Uh, maybe you want to quit leaving toothpaste in the sink. I don't know what your big goal is. But whatever it is that, that you're striving for, I, I, I don't know about you, but maybe, maybe some of you want to get better with your money or you want to quit some annoying habit that you know that you need to get rid of, you need to stop doing. I don't know what it'd be, but I pray that God would give you the power to achieve those, whatever you call them, resolutions, goals, uh, ambition, because there's something about starting a, a new year that brings hope. Anybody else feel that way? It just, when you, when you, especially this year, my goodness, and this one hadn't started off the greatest, in the greatest trajectory, but I believe God's going to make it great. But when, amen, hallelujah, I don't believe what we're seeing now is going to be the end of it. And I don't know why it is, I, I guess it's almost like a psychological thing because we could change at any time, but I don't see anybody at Thanksgiving say, I feel like I'm going to start eating better. We all say, when Thanksgiving and Christmas get over, and then you got New Year's Day you got to get past, and then somebody's going to have a birthday on January the 5th, and, and when, that, when that thing's over, then you got the national championship game, Lord knows you got to eat there. And, and so we always got something, you know, we're going to do better. And, but there's something about the first of the year, so when I look at the lives of those who have it together, here, here's, here's what I start doing at the first year, here's what I did. When I look at the lives of those, when I look at them, they seem to have it all together in some area of their life more than I do. I don't know how you feel about it, but sometimes that intimidates me. When I know how hard it is for me to do something and to stay on track, and I see somebody that's just consistently doing it right, it's intimidating. I look at them and think, man, they must have, their whole life must be together. I look at their lives and I'll say, they're so much better than I am in that area, and it's intimidating to me. And I don't even know what big things I need to do to get those kind of results. And I've, I've got no idea all the big changes that I need to make. But I want to bring some good news to you today, if you've ever felt that way. And today's message, I'm just going to tell you, this is more of a practical, take it home and use it kind of message. Uh, that's what I want to preach. I don't want to impress you. I, I was listening to a great preacher this past week, and I was driving down the road, and I'm listening to these podcasts, and, and he, was, he, was, he was speaking to preachers, and he was telling preachers how to preach better sermons. And this guy is a great preacher. He is a preacher's preacher. If I mentioned him, you would know him. And I'm listening to the podcast, and he was going through the process of how he builds a sermon, gets a thought, puts an outline, kind of like I do. And then he said, once I get done with it, when I complete it, I get a thesaurus, and I go through the words and I change the words to put in more impressive words. And I told Kim, I said, I can do that. I've got a few little $200 words I've learned, you know, instead of opposite antithesis, instead of, you know, I've got a few that I can do that way. But I, I told Kim, I said, I think sometimes we preachers get in this rut of trying to preach so eloquently that we preach above someone's understanding. And I don't know about you, I'm a simple man that just needs a simple message. So I don't want to... 
I don't want to take deep things and avoid them. I want to take the deep things and can we understand them? Can we just communicate them in a practical way? And so that's what, so I did take the the source out and I took the big words and made them smaller. Because I I really believe that it's, it's, it's not often the big changes that we need to make. But if you're taking note, here's our key thought for this message. It's often, you'll hear me say this phrase a bunch of times today because this is the theme. It's the small things that nobody sees that produces the results that everybody sees. I'm going to say that again. It's the small things that nobody sees that produces the results that everybody sees. Let me give you some examples. There was a a guy a few years ago that's a close friend of mine now, and he's been a close friend for many, many years, older than I am, but... Uh, he was in my dad's church, my dad pastored, and, and he was in ministry as a young man. And so I always just really admired him and, and because when I was a teenager, he was in his probably late 20s, and I just always looked up to him and admired him. He was one of those kind of guys that didn't just have to tell you he was a Christian, but you knew by the way he talked and he walked and he lived his life that he was a Christian. And I remember years ago when I was wanting to grow in the Lord and I wanted to know more about the Lord, I wanted to be a good Christian. I, wanted to, I wasn't in ministry yet, but I just wanted to live for the Lord in a way that was appropriate. And I wanted to walk in a holy life, a righteous life, and I really didn't know how to do that. And I went to this man one day, we were talking, I said, this guy was one of those type men that anytime you had a conversation with him, he was very succinct in the way that he would respond to you because in his mind, he was thinking of a scripture that he could give you that would match what he was trying, the advice he was trying to give to you. And I remember one time that I I went up to him and you could tell he was just a prayerful, spiritual man. And he would, as I said, would always respond with scriptures and you could just really sense that he was being led by the Spirit in everything that he did. And I asked him, I said, what's your secret? Like, what are the big things you do to get these results? How is it that you walk in such humility and wisdom and the word? What's the big things that that you do? And he said, well, he said, I honestly think things changed for me. That's what he told me back then. He said, I really think things changed for me 15 years ago when I took a year and I read the Bible all the way through. And he said, every year since then, I have read the Bible all the way through every single year. Just each year, I read it from cover to cover, and it's helped me be grounded in the things of God. And I was like, well, of course, if you read the Bible through in a year for 15 years, you're going to be wise like this guy. That's such a big thing. And I said, that's a... That's a big deal. And he said, no, 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 no. He said, and I'll never forget this, and I'm about to help somebody right here. He said, no, no, no. He said, it's not. He said, it's, it's really not. He said, think about it. He said, it takes me somewhere between 10 and 15 minutes a day to read a little scripture for 10 to 15 minutes every single day. And he said, if I'll discipline myself to read the Bible between 10 and 15 minutes a day, and he said, sometimes it's not all at the same time. Sometimes it's five minutes in the morning, five minutes at lunch, five minutes before I go to bed. But if I'll read the Bible 15 minutes a day, I will read the Bible all the way through in one year. I'll never forget what that man told me because I saw the results. I saw, he told me the secret that nobody saw that produced the results that everybody saw. And he said, when I started doing that, he said, it changed my spiritual walk with the Lord. When I got the word inside of my heart, because when you put it in your heart, the Holy Spirit then helps you to remember it, but you can't remember what you've never remembered. I don't know if that's a, look look in your thesaurus for that one. He'll bring it back to you if you put it in your heart and you put it in your mind. And so from that day on, every year for the last almost 27 years, I have read the Bible through. Now this year I'm reading it chronologically. I don't read it from Genesis to Revelation. I read it, and i got a chronological Bible, and I read about 10 or 15 minutes a day in addition to my other study. And I've read the Bible through for almost, almost 28 years. I've been able to read the Bible all the way through every year, and it has radically changed my life. How many of you in here could chip out? 10 to 15 minutes a day and read the Bible all the way through. See that? Small things make a big difference. And if I'm just faithful with that, I'll give you another example. In 2019, I lost a bunch of weight. In 2020, I found all of it back plus more. 
And that has been the pattern of my adult life. I've got two closets at my house. One's the skinny closet, one's the not skinny closet. The not skinny closet clothes are getting tight on me. I'm concerned about this. So I made up my mind this year like I've done my whole life. I mean, you don't, you don't ever know. You can look at the pictures on my Facebook profile. You don't ever know if I'm big or small. It just, and I'll put a small one up there because I'll be back by the end of the year. It's just always, and I'm always fighting genetics, and I'm fighting uh, Twinkies. They still make those. I'm, I'm fighting all this stuff, you know, to, to exercise, to eat right, to, you know, to get the proper rest and all of those and the, all those things. And I have this friend, and he's a pastor. And see, I use all these excuses. I talk about the stress of 2020 and, you know, all the things. And I'm, I'm the type guy when you're, when you're under pressure, man, I, I don't back off. I go full force. And if I'm on an exercise diet plan, I'm telling you, I am like... I'm like, I'm like going to the trainer, going to the gym. I'm like, I, I don't eat. I'm talking about I wouldn't eat a piece of bread. When I'm on in 2019, I wouldn't eat a piece of bread if you baked it right in front of me. I just, I had willpower. But when I broke, I broke. Now I'll eat a piece. I smell bread right now talking about it. I drove by the donut guy on the way to church, and I said, my Lord, I'd like to have a donut. And I was running late, didn't have time. And I said, I can't eat donuts. So there's this temptation. This, this, so I, so I, I talked to this guy. I've got this pastor friend. He's got the same, I mean, he pastors the same church, size church that I pastor. He's got the same level of stress I have. He's the same age I am. But yet he consistently remains in better shape. He's got the same kind of genetic because I've seen his daddy and mama. He got the same kind of genetics that I have to fight. And I called him and I said, how is it? I said, I need to know. It's a new year. I'm trying to get back on track. I'm trying to get back to the gym. I'm trying to exercise. I'm trying to eat right. I'm trying to get everything regulated. COVID's kind of leveled off. When you're sitting at home for nine weeks and there's nothing to eat but carbs, come on, somebody. It's tough. So, and then once you get addicted to it, you know, you need deliverance. And I, I'm praying for it. But I said, what do you do? I said, what's your diet plan? How, I said, what's your, what, how do you stay in such consistently good shape with all the dynamics around you? I said, do you go to the gym? He said, yeah, I go three times a week. I said, three times a week? And I mean, this guy, you know, he looks like he work. I said, you look like you work out seven days a week. I said, three days a week? He said, yeah, three days a week. He said, sometimes four. And I said, well, how long do you work out? You work out like, like two hours? He said, no, 40 minutes. I said, 40 minutes? I said, what do you do? He said, I do 20 minutes of cardio. I do 20 minutes of weights. I do that typically Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I said, really? Well, what kind of diet plan are you on? He said, I just try not to eat a lot of bread and sweets. I said, really? He said, I eat a lot of protein, try not to eat sugars. I said, that's all? He said, that's all. And I said, and that, that works for you? you? You go four days, not seven days. And you work out for 40 minutes and your diet plan. I said, are you kidding me? What else do you do? He said, nothing. That's it. He said, I work out 40 minutes a day, three days a week, 20 minutes cardio. He said, I used to do seven days a week. I used to do all this. out." He said, but I got in better shape letting my body rest and doing it this way. And I thought, seriously, because what he's telling me is, he, I said, I can do that. I can do three days a week. I can do that. 40 minutes, I can do that. Just kind of eat, I mean, the, the carbs I don't know about, but I'm going to try to do that. And I said, I can do that small things. Really, it's not big things. It's not as big as I'm trying to make it. It's not because when I try to go in, I, go, I try to go for the big things. I'm thinking, okay, I want to go from zero to hero. That's what I want to do. And so I'm going for the big things. And he said, no, it's just, he said, it's just simple. It's just little things. And so what I've learned is, is that the things that we do that nobody sees results in the results that everybody sees. Another example, I was talking to a marriage counselor. And I said, you know, I've, I've worked with married couples for years and premarital counseling and all that. And I had an opportunity to talk to them a while back, a couple, a few months ago. I said, what do you think it is for a Christian marriage, one of the most important things that you could do? He didn't hesitate. Immediately, he said, he said, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the greatest thing that a Christian couple can do together, he said, if you want to have a great marriage, he said, pray together every day. I said, okay, what does that look like? Does that mean that you have a private prayer meeting and you get together and you pray, you have your hour of prayer? He said, no. He said, just pray over your meal together. It can be 30 seconds or it can be 30 minutes. But he said, just pray together. He said, because if you're praying together, then you're talking together. 
And if you're talking together and he said you're praying together, he said it's hard to pray with somebody who you don't like. And you'll learn that you're, come on somebody, some of y'all need to start praying together, I'm just going to tell you. Small things make a big difference, and when we do the things that nobody sees, it results in the thing that everybody sees. So if I stop right now, we've learned that if we want to be a better Christian, we read the Bible every day. We've learned the simple things that we can do to get in better shape physically, and we've learned the things that we can do to make our marriage better. And all those things make us holistically healthy because God said, I would that you be in health and that, you're, that you prosper even as your soul prospers. So what I want to do today is build a foundation. Zechariah chapter 4 was our text, and I want to tell you where we're going to go with this message, and I want to break it down and give you one very specific, very direct, one very focused assignment to focus on before we leave here today. One small thing that I believe can make a big difference. So let me tell you about the context of Zechariah chapter 4 this morning. We read the text, but let me tell you where that text comes from. During the time that it was written, the temple had been destroyed and God's people were in captivity. So it was one of the lowest points in Jewish history. They had been exiled and they're scattered abroad. And so Zechariah 4 picks up during that time of this low point in history. And we, at that time, they didn't have a house for God. There was no temple where they would go and they would worship. And we're not even in the place, they're saying, we're not even in the place we're supposed to be. There's no place to go worship. We're not in the place that we're supposed to be. And so people were very depressed. And in the year 537 B.C., Zerubbabel led a remnant of people back to Israel. And there was some hope. Because God's people are now going back to their homeland. They're going back to Jerusalem. And they're back in the land where they're supposed to be. And then 18 years later, after they get back to Jerusalem, God spoke to King Zerubbabel. And he said to him, I'm going to give you power to rebuild the temple. I want you to hear that. God said, I'm going to give you the power to rebuild the temple. So look at verse 6 again, if we can put that on the screen. Chapter 4 and verse 6. It says, then he said to me, this is what the Lord says to Zerubbabel. It is not by force, it is not by strength, but it is by my spirit, says the Lord of heaven's army. Nothing, not even a mighty mountain will stand in Zerubbabel's way. It will become a level plain before him. And when Zerubbabel sets the final stone of the temple in place, the people will shout, may God bless it, may God bless it. One translation says they will shout, grace, grace. Amen. And so we see here that the Lord is speaking to Zerubbabel and he says, it's not going to be by your force. It's not going to be by your might. It's not going to be by your strength. In other words, the temple's not going to be built in a way that you could get credit for it. You're not going to get the credit for it, but it's going to be built by what? The Lord said it's going to be built by my spirit. The Lord says this is going to be accomplished through my spirit. Let's say it aloud. Say it's not by force. It's not by strength, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. Here's the thing. You can try to to change, and you can try to change the things that you desire to change in your own power, and you can make some incremental improvements in your life. You can lose the weight and then gain it back. You can can start and you can stop. But if you'll tap into the power of the Holy Ghost that enables you to do what God's called you to do. I I, I was on Facebook this past week, and there was a question asked. It says, it says, Pentecostal preaching is blank. And it's, some of the guys in this room may have seen this on this site. But it, and it asked you to fill in the blank. What is Pentecostal preaching? And some of these guys got their thesaurus out because they answered this long. I mean, it was this long. And I read it and I thought to myself, what is, in other words, what's the distinctive? You are in a Pentecostal church today. What is the distinctive? Is it speaking in tongues? Is it, is it the gifts of the Spirit? Those are things we believe in doctrinally and we, 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 we uh, understand are things of the Spirit. But what, what identifies Pentecostal preaching? My response was, it is Christ-focused, it is Spirit-empowered, it is mission-led. 
It is Christ's focus. Our preaching, if we are Pentecostal, we're pointing people to Christ. That is our focus. We point people to Jesus. We can, we can be Pentecostal all day long, but the Holy Ghost didn't come to speak of himself. He came to point people to Jesus. You shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you will be witnesses of me, Jesus said. So we are Christ-centered. We are Spirit-empowered. That's what Zerubbabel, that's what God was saying to Zerubbabel, when he said it's not by your might it's not by your power but God said it's by my spirit I want to stop right here and tell somebody if you'll let the spirit of God give you the power if you'll seek after him there is nothing that is impossible if we can give him the glory and we can receive his power he'll empower you to move mountains that verse says Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, and mission-led. What is the mission? Our mission is the co-mission that Jesus gave us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And if you preach Jesus, if you're empowered by the Holy Ghost, and if you're winning souls, then praise God, you just identified yourself as a Pentecostal. If you'll tap into that power that's greater than you, if you'll tap into the power of the Holy Spirit, his spirit, is made, his spirit is made perfect in your weaknesses, the Bible says. He's made perfect in your weakness because when we are weak, he is strong. <laughs> and not by our effort, not by our might, not by our power, but by his spirit, he can transform you. Some people say you shouldn't pray. Don't pray that you can lose weight. Quit eating so much. And that is true. But I don't know. I just believe the Lord can help us. I believe the Lord can help us. I believe that God can, God can add his power to our desire. What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them, and you shall have them. It could be that the things that make us better to serve the Lord, to live longer, to do the things God's called us to live, that God's okay with that. And God will give us the Holy Ghost, not just to shout and talk in tongues and fall on the floor, but God will give us the Holy Ghost to empower us to be who he called us to be and to do what he called us to do. That's Pentecost. And you can try your best all day long to make all your changes, but when you tap into the Spirit of God, there is a strength beyond yourself that you cannot muster up on your own. And some of you have tried for years to change something, to improve something, to, 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 that you cannot do it. And this is the year that it will not be by your might. It will not be by your power. Some of you are trying to break an addiction. Some of you in here, you, you smoke cigarettes. I'm just, I don't know who you are, but I'm just going to call it out. And I'm going to tell you, you do not need to be smoking cigarettes. You need to quit. It's bad for you. You say, well, is that a heaven-hell issue? Wherever you go, you're going to get there quicker. You keep smoking those things. Because it says on the pack, these will kill you. Suicide on the installment plan. Amen. Little by little, it's killing you. And so you need to stop. You know you need to stop. You've tried to stop. And it feels like you can't stop. I come to tell you this morning, it's not by your might. It's not by your power. My father-in-law got saved in his early 40s. And he had smoked from the time he was 12 years old. This is not my notes. I didn't plan to say it. But it's for somebody, so receive it. I'm saying it in love because I love you and care about you. You may be watching. You may be in here today. Y'all take a sniff. You'll know who I'm talking about. I can't believe I just said that. I need you back over here to keep me in line. I forgot what I was going to say. If you will trust the Lord, my father-in-law, yes, he was 44, in the early 40s when he got saved, and he smoked from the time he was 12. He tried everything he could to quit. I mean, he tried. He was, he was the best man, one of the best men I've ever met in my life. And he tried everything he could to quit. He was one of those type that he wouldn't carry his cigarettes with him when he went somewhere, but as soon as he got somewhere where he could find them, he got them because he, he had that addiction he'd had his whole life, and he asked God to, to deliver him. He asked God, and he just struggled with it. I remember that he had had a heart attack. He had a, a couple of heart attacks that were the result of his smoking. He was a Christian, but he had smoked, and he had a heart attack. And I remember they ended up in the hospital, and my oldest daughter was about Titus's age over there. He's, she was about three. And she went to kids' church that morning, and they were taking prayer requests, and she said, would you pray my papa will quit smoking so he doesn't die? 
And so her dad got word of that. And he, after smoking for 30 years of his life, all of his adult life and most of his teen, all of his teenage life, he left that hospital and never smoked another cigarette because he said, God, you've got to help me. And God gave him the power. I've seen people get up. God will do what you cannot do on your own. If it's drugs, if it's prescription pain medicine, whatever it is, that if it's Coca-Cola, whoo, I didn't go there, did I? How many know you can get addicted to Coca-Cola? Now, I'm not up here preaching you're going to go to hell if you drink Coca-Cola. Don't get mad at me. I'm just telling you because every now and then I'll slip up and stumble and fall and drink a Diet Coke, okay? But I'm telling you those things are addictive. Well, I'm messing with people. I ought not go here. God will help you. It's bad for you. If I'm going to preach on cigarettes and y'all going to shout with me, you better shout with me on that too because it's bad for you. And God will help you. If you don't believe it, every year back when I used to drink those things all the time, every year in January, I would fast for 30 days. I would fast. And I'm telling you, when I would try to get rid of caffeine for 30 days, it was tough. I mean, for the first seven days, I would have excruciating headaches. I'd have withdrawals. And I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm just saying those are the kind of, you got to look at your life and anything you can't do without, you do not need. Well, I didn't plan to say that, and I didn't expect much more than that, to be honest with you. So thank you for what I got indulging me. God says, I'm going to give you power. Here's what he said to Zerubbabel. God said, I'm going I'm to give you my power to rebuild the temple. And in verse 7, he says, nothing, not even a mighty mountain will stand in Zerubbabel's way. It will become le a level plain before him. In other words, God says when God calls somebody to do something, there is no force on this earth, not even a great mountain, that will keep you from reaching the, the power and the will of God will help you to reach what he's assigned you to. He goes on to say, and when Zerubbabel sets the final stone on the temple in place, the people will shout, may God bless it. May God bless it. I love the fact that before the construction starts, God's already describing the end of the project. Before you ever get there, God knows the end from the beginning. He knows A and he knows Z. That's why he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And the little translate, literal translation is not that he's the beginning and the end. It is that he is the beginning through and to the end. Yeah, he's A and he's Z, but he's also God at T, trouble, test, trials. He'll be God at P, problem, and pits. And he'll be God in the Ds, the disasters and the discouragement and the depression. God's God through all that. And he'll get you through all that, and he'll get you from the beginning to the end. And it's not by our might, it's not by our power, but it is by the Spirit of the Lord. Can somebody give the Lord praise in this house this morning if you believe it? And if, you'll, if we can pause there for just a moment, I did a little research on, on kind of the background of the story, and what I found was that the initial phases of the construction was actually really awkward. When they began to rebuild this temple, it was, it was awkward. It, it went really, really slowly. I don't know if you've ever built something or had something built, but it gets frustrating when it goes slow, when you can't dig a footer because the rain won't stop. And you pour, can't pour concrete because the, the ground's too wet. And all of this stuff, it, it just, it, it went slowly. And if you read in the book, read in Ezra, there were times when people visited in the early stages of construction. And the Bible says that when they visited, it's the same story, the same event that we're reading here. In Ezra, it says that when they visited the, the construction site, that the people would gather and that they actually cried. Now, can you imagine going to a construction site and just seeing a bunch of people crying? Now, this is a big deal. This is the temple that's being built. And, and they're gathered around crying, and it, it's debatable as to why they cried. Some people say they cried because they were overwhelmed with the fact that the temple was being built. But most people that read this and theologians will say and actually argue that they cried because they were embarrassed because it was so unimpressive. As they're building this thing, all it was was a pile of rocks. And it was so unimpressive that they wept 
because they were building this for the Lord. This was to the glory of God, and it was not like Solomon's temple. It was not like the other Moses' tabernacle that was so beautiful. This was just a pile of rocks at the beginning. It was just kind of a, a foundation. It's so small, so pathetic, just a few rocks there, and they're like, this isn't going to amount to anything. And the reality is, that's the way we often feel, isn't it? You go through the things of life and you say, man, I'm trying to serve the Lord, but when I look around at some of these folks, man, I'm just, it's sad. It's sad. I'm up one minute, down the next minute. I'm trying to read the Word one second, and you're a new Christian, and I'm trying to read the Word one minute, and I find myself slipping out, and I'm good at church for a while, but then I find I'm not going to church, and now I hadn't been there in five or six weeks. I'm not reading my Bible. I'm not praying. I'm not living for the Lord like I should, and I look around at all the other folks that seem to have it all together, and they're doing all these big things. No, it's just little things that nobody sees that makes a big difference that everybody desires. And you have to start where you are. You can't expect to build something overnight. You can't expect to. And when I, I told Wednesday night, if you were here, I'll tell you, I pulled up, and there was a guy that had a, a vehicle just like mine, but his was about 20 years older, and it was, it was blowing black smoke out of it when he pulled up. And when he pulled up as a young guy, and we're at the gas station. I was telling this story Wednesday for a whole different purpose, an entirely different purpose. But we pulled up, and we're at the gas station. I'm trying. I've asked God this year to give me people to just live the gospel before. And so he, he struck up a conversation with me. The first thing he said was, because he had a car, like I said, same model, same brand as mine, but his was smoking. Mine, thank God, was not. And he said, he looked at me, he said, I'll trade you. I said, man, I'll go get the payment book. We'll trade right now. <laughs> and we started, we started talking back and forth. And we started talking back, back and forth a little bit. He was talking about, man, I'm trying to work this job. He had a, he had a vest on. I said, where do you work? He had like a, a yellow vest. He said, I work here at Walmart. That's where I was getting gas. And he said, I work here at Walmart. And he started saying, I've got a, got a family. He, he was just a nice young man. And he was saying, I'm just trying. He said, man, my wife's got a good car. He said, I'm going to try to get me something different. I'm trying to save my money up. We're buying a house. I'm trying to save. And we were just talking. And I said, man, you're young. I said, take it. I have to tell my kids that sometimes. If I, I said, when I was your age, I was so far behind where you are right now. I wasn't even close to where you are. And they feel like they've got to go from here. Listen, if you're here this morning and you're 20 years old, don't compare yourself to a 50-year-old. I looked at him. I said, man, I'm old. I've been saving my money for a long time, and I ain't saved enough. I'm gonna work. I said, I'm working toward retirement when I'm 107. So I'm just asking God to give me long life. I said, just, man, just stay, just stay consistent. Don't worry about stuff. Keep driving this thing. Keep saving for that house. I, I'm sitting there doing a Dave Ramsey on them right there in the parking lot of, of Walmart. Keep, keep saving for that house. I said, I had a car just like that when I was in my 20s. I had a car like that. It used more oil than it did gas. I carried two gallons of oil with me because I couldn't afford to get the gasket replaced. So I just kept pouring the oil in there, $35 a gallon. It was a, I won't explain the rest of that. Just kept pouring oil in it to keep it running, blowing that black smoke out there. I called it mosquito killer. But you know, I kept, I, I said Dave Ramsey, you got to live like nobody else so you can live like nobody else. And that's what I told him you got to do. And it, it, it really sparked this message. You've got to do the small things that nobody sees so that you can receive the big things that everybody sees. I, I, we say, I've got to make all these changes. I try so hard and, and I, I do all this. And we get embarrassed. And often we get embarrassed because of the small beginnings. You go to the gym. You go get a trainer. And you're doing all this. And I don't know why I'm focused on this other than pure conviction. That's why I'm preaching this. <laughs> and you do all these things. And you, 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 you know, you're working, you're working, you're working, you're sweating, you're sweating, you're sweating, you're tired, you're aching, your muscles hurt, and you go get on the scales and you're like, yes, first week, I want to, what, 10 pounds, 15 pounds, 20 pounds, I gained a pound. <laughs> what? And somebody says, well, that's probably muscle. I said, in a week, I gained a pound of muscle in a week. But you've got to start continue because consistency is the key to breakthrough. I'm, I'm, I said this just practical. Verse 10 says this, and I hope this will encourage you. He says, do not despise these small beginnings for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. You hear that? 
It says, don't despise small beginnings for the Lord. He just rejoices to see you getting started. When he, Because when he sees you doing what you can do, God says, all right, now I'm going to show up and do what you can't do. When, I'm going to say that again. When you do what you can do, God does what you can't do. When you, amen, praise the Lord. When you want to start that business, I'm just, I'm just going to say this. When you want to start that business and you're doing all you can to get your credit right, to pay some bills off, to save up a little cash, and you do all that, God is going to give you the right building. God's going to give you the right employees. God's going to do what you can't do when you do what you can do. I've watched this over and over and over again. But you've got to start somewhere because the Bible says that the Lord rejoices when we start. You've got to put one stone before you can put the second stone. You've got to start before you can ever finish. And God rejoices to see you faithful in the small things. And one of the challenges is that so often we look at people, we look at people and we look at their highlight reels and we don't know what goes on behind the scenes. We don't know the small things. We see the gain, but we don't know the pain. We see the glory and we don't know the story. We don't know what they've been through to get to where they are. I'm telling you, you've got to be very careful about that because if you're not careful, you'll get a critical spirit when you see somebody driving a new car because you don't know what they had to do to save to get that new car. It could be that that person has been driving that beater that's held together with rust and Christian bumper stickers for 15 years so that they could save enough money to get them something dependable that they could drive. You don't know the whole story. We look at Facebook and all we see are edited, filtered realities of life. Social media is a billboard. All it is, a billboard, all it is, they say put less than seven words on a billboard because all it is is like a bullet point. And we look at each other, especially in the world we live in now, we look at social media. I'm speaking to those on that balcony, the, our young people that are here. Don't, don't judge your life by somebody else's edited and filtered social media. That's a billboard. They're not showing you their diary. The small print, we don't, put, we don't put small print on social media. We want it to, I mean, it's true for us pastors. I, sometimes I'll come to church and nobody gets saved and nobody, I mean, nobody's helping me preach. Y'all sleep right through my sermon. And, and it's, like, it's like attendance is down, the worship is off, all of that. And I'll go to Facebook and I'll look at it because I got all these preachers. And all I see is 36 million people in church today. 800,000 got saved. 110 million filled with the whole. That's how I read it in my eyes. And when I compare to that, I feel like a failure. And God never called me to be that. God called me just to do what I can do and just to lay the stones one stone at a time. It's the same thing for you. If you'll be faithful in the small things and shut out the clutter that surrounds you and just be faithful, God will do what you can't do. Don't compare yourself to everybody else. That will keep you from ever getting where God wants you when you're trying to be somebody else. You're a terrible somebody else. If, I, I've said this before. I said it the very first Sunday I pastored this church. I, I've said it repeatedly. This church has had some of the great, greatest pastors and preachers in the world. Uh, that would, you think that would intimidate me? Nope. Not because I think I'm that great, because I know who I am. I know I am an awful Sam Luke. Anybody would be a terrible Sam Luke. Sam Luke ain't even that great of a Sam Luke. I know Sam Luke. I'm a terrible Al Bristow. I'm a terrible Gary Tiger. I'm an awful Kip Box. But I'm the best David Smith you'll find. And I'm just going to be me. And I'm going to lay one stone. And I'm going to honor them because they're great at being them. But I can't be them. I, I can't no matter how I try. Because if I try to be any of them, then I'm, I'm kidding myself. I'm cheating me and you from who I'm supposed to be. Whoa, I'm preaching right here. And I'm going to say it for me. I'm saying it for you. God has called you to do the same thing. Young people, don't try to be somebody else. Quit trying to be, for God's sake, quit trying to be the Kardashians. Quit it. That's not normal. That's not reality. Just stop it. 
Just be who God's called you to be. Be a leader. Go somewhere that nobody's ever been and make a trail that's never been made and you lead the way. You be a leader. Amen. <laughs> little by little. One of the challenges is so often we look at people, and as I said, and we see their highlights. Social media, I'm going to say this again, it's a billboard, not a diary. Don't, you, you don't see the small print of life. I'm blessed to live, I don't live in a big house, I don't live in a real expensive house, I live in a nice house. I'm just saying this, I, I live in a good neighborhood, I love where we live, I love it so much. I told somebody, we just refinanced our house and I said, I'm, I'm committed for at least another four-year contract to Oak Park because I owe my soul to the company store. <laughs> Thank y'all. But I just, I just didn't, I thought, I love, I love my house, I love the neighborhood, God's blessed me to have a Nice house to live in. But what you don't know, and we were talking about this week, is the first parsonage. We, I talked last week about the snake and a house. That was a nice house. But the first, when we first started pastoring, we had saved a little to build a house. And we took, I left a really good job. And I'm thankful I did it. I'm not saying this for you to feel sorry for me or to act like I sacrificed. It was God's will. I, I, would, I wouldn't change a thing. But I left a really good paying job. Matter of fact, they gave me a promotion when I went in to quit. And they, they told me they were giving me a promotion. I said, well, actually, what happened was I come to turn my notice in that I've got to leave. And I left that good-paying job to take a church with 10 people with a salary of $150 a week and a two-bedroom parsonage that was rat-infested and a little savings. And we moved, and we pastored that little group of people. And I'm telling you, I hate snakes and I hate mice. And I remember this has been... 25 years ago, and I remember Kim, <laughs> I'd see a mouse and I'd run. I'm like, we're burning this place down. I'm leaving. <laughs> and I remember Kim, we had a house torn down beside us, and there were like these gopher rats this big that came into the house. And they would, you could hear them. You'd sit in the living room, and you could hear them. Gnaw, I mean, they gnawed our washer, dishwasher holes apart. They, they, they ate the house. <laughs> I was afraid they were going to eat my leg. So I walk, I walk into the kitchen one day, and here's Kim, and she's got, she's got a broom and a baseball bat sitting on the table and a net waiting on those. Listen, I could tell you worse stories. I didn't always live in the house I live in now, but I tried to be faithful to the Lord and his calling back then. And so you don't always know. I could tell you some stuff. You could tell me stuff. But when I stepped out by faith and did it, when I had a little car that I thought, that I had to pray. That we, I mean, I was visiting hospitals and the transmission was going out and I would literally go out there and wipe the oil off the hood and anoint it and say, God, in the name of Jesus. I would, I'm going to tell you something that you may not believe and it doesn't matter. But that thing, I didn't have gas to put in the gas tank to get me to the hospitals and back because all the hospitals were in Chattanooga, which was 20 minutes away. And I would pray, God, help me, help this gas go farther. And I would pray for that, and I had a Pontiac Grand Prix that when I would check the mileage, now you, you may not believe it's like I said, it doesn't matter. I'm just telling you what I know. I would check the mileage, that little Pontiac Grand Prix at times would get 50 miles a gallon. Supernatural. Because I did what I could, God did what I couldn't. And along the way, God blessed the church, and as a result, God began to bless us. And along the way, I've had people say, I don't know why that preacher drives that. And, he lived. and you get all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, you don't know the journey. You don't know the times that you saved. You don't know the investments. And nobody said that. I've never heard that. But I'm just saying that about me rather than tell your story. Because the reality is, if we bless somebody who we don't know their story, all we see is the result. You don't know all the small things that brought those results that everybody sees. But if we'll bless that person who's blessed, then we'll receive what we sow. Find somebody that God's blessing and say, praise God, I celebrate with you. And watch what God will do for you in return i got to move on. Come on, give the Lord praise this morning. Let me try. I'm out of time. Let me try to say this, and I'll get us done in the next few minutes. Look at David. He was a man after God's own heart. He took down Goliath. He took down a giant. That's what we see. But what we didn't see, what they didn't see, were the times when he was fighting the lions and the bears and the wild animals in the backside of a pasture 
where he was exiled away from his brothers doing the hard manual labor while his brothers lived in the house. We forget he was faithful for years, tending sheep. What was happening? He was learning to be faithful in the small things so God could trust him with the big things. Yeah. People look at Ruth and Boaz, girls all the time saying, man, I, I want a husband like Boaz. Boaz just sounds so handsome. He sounds so rich. Okay, you forget that Ruth was faithful to Naomi, her mother-in-law, when she didn't have to be. She gleaned in a field with her mother-in-law when she didn't have to. She was faithful in the, out in the field for years and years, for time after time, and it was her faithfulness and the small things that opened the doors for the blessings through Boaz. It was the things that no one saw that resulted in the marriage that everyone wants. We look at Daniel in the Bible and we're like, man, he's got such faith. I mean, he's standing in a lion's den. His faith is unwavering. I want to fight like that. Well, what you may forget is that three times a day, year after year, you know what Daniel did? He prayed. He stopped whatever he was doing and knelt down three times a day, every day, and he sought the Lord in prayer. What kind of faith do you think we'd have if we stopped three times a day to pray unto the Lord? We could probably stand in a lion's den and fight off the enemy. It's the things that no one sees that results in what everybody wants. I read a book this year called Wooden on Leadership. I've read it before, and it's a book about John Wooden. He was one of the greatest basketball coaches of all time. I love basketball. John Wooden was one of the greatest basketball coaches of all time. He coached for UCLA. He had 10 NCAA titles, seven consecutive titles, which was unheard of between 1967 and 1973. And I was reading about something that John Wooden did. <laughs> they said that this great basketball coach, he was the Nick Saban of basketball in his day. And this great basketball coach, every year on the first day of practice, you know what he did? This is amazing to me. The very first practice every year, they didn't run drills. They didn't shoot free throws. They didn't run plays. They didn't run, they didn't even do conditioning. You know what they did on the very first day of practice? He'd set all of his players down and he'd teach them how to put on their socks and tie their shoes. And they'd take them off and it said, do it again. And they'd demonstrate how to put on their socks properly and how to tie their shoes properly. And he said the reason they did that is because one of the unknown secrets of the teams that he coached is none of his players ever got blisters on their feet because they put on their socks properly and they put on their shoes properly. So you never had a five-star player sitting on the bench injured because he didn't put his socks on properly. It was the little things that nobody saw that created the big difference and the big results that everybody wanted. Isn't that something? You see, I love that because it's those small things. There's three things that I want to challenge you to focus on this morning. And then I'm done. One thought. How to change your life. There's three things. Number one, start by changing your thoughts. Can you say that? Your thoughts. The Bible says as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If you want to change who you are, change the way you think. If, if, if you want to think stinking thinking, you're going to have a stinking life. You've got to change the way you think. Now listen, God's on his throne. He's sovereign. He's God. We're not. I get that. But I'm telling you, the, your thoughts, the way you think will guide your life. As a man thinks, so is he. The second one is our words. There's power of life and death in our words. Change your thought, change your words. Watch what you say and how you say it. Change your words. You want to you change your life, change the word you speak. Then thirdly, and I'm going through this quickly, because we, we want to become who we, we become, what we repeatedly do. The third one is our habits. Change our thoughts, change our word, change our habits. You want to become a different person, change your habits. Make, make those small changes that create big results. And then I'm, I'm, I'm finished with this and I'm going to turn you loose. One thing. This, this, this year, there's one thing that you can do. What one, if there's one thing you can do, what is it? 
not a million things. I, I, I've got a whole lot of preaching on this. Maybe I'll get to it the second service, get through this first part quicker and get to that because it's so important. David said, this one thing I do. Paul said, this one thing I do. One thing, there's power in one thing, and I don't have time to unpack it right now. Watch the second service and maybe I'll get to it. But there's power in one thing. Don't try to do a hundred things. I want you to think right now, what's that one thing? I'll tell you, I prayed, last year I had a word that God gave me personally. Gave me one for the church, gave me one for myself personally. Because I prayed this prayer. This year, before January, I prayed the same thing. You start right now. But not a million things, but, but one word. Maybe that word for you is faith. Maybe you want your faith to grow. Maybe it's, maybe it's health. Whatever it is. For me, last year, it was strength. I didn't know what that meant. But I wanted to strengthen some things in my life. I wanted to strengthen some things in my ministry. I wanted to tighten some things up and it be strong. This year, I was praying and the Lord gave me a word that I don't like. I don't like it at all. But it's the word God gave me in prayer. It was the word rest. I don't want to rest. I don't like, rest stresses me out. Kim will tell you, it stresses me. I can't take a nap. I can't sit still. Rest wears me out. If I go on vacation, I got to get something to do because I can't just rest. And I'm not talking about taking a nap. That's not what the Lord told me. What the Lord was telling me is to rest in Him. Not just to rest my body. That's not a bad thing. Rest your mind, that's not a bad thing either. But I believe what the Lord is really telling me was to rest in the assurance that God has everything under control. He's got it under control. <clears throat> and to lean on Him. And so that's my word this year. I'm just going to, I'm going to work. I'm going to put my hand to the plow. John, I'm going to work as hard as I can work, but I'm going to rest when I've done all I can do. That's all I can do. And now just rest in the assurance of His word. If there's one thing, one word, I want you to get it in your mind right now. This is how I want to, in this service this morning. If there's one word that you can say this year, this is what I believe that God is calling me to do. If you're in this room and you don't know the Lord is your Savior, that one word could be surrender. That one word could be confess. If we confess our sins before the Lord, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Maybe you're in this room in this balcony or on this floor and you don't know Jesus as your Savior. You're in church today and that's a good start. But you've heard me say it before, standing in a garage doesn't make you a car. And being in church doesn't make you a Christian. You have to know you have a real relationship with the Lord and you've asked Jesus into your heart. And is he Lord of your life? Now, you may not have the big things down yet, but you can start right now with the small thing that makes a big difference. And the small thing is just saying, God, I need you. Just pray a prayer and ask God in your heart. Let him come in, take residence, and then he'll just let you, that first stone, you can look back and say, man, look at what a mess I am compared to all these people here. But you know what? God, when you start, when you begin, God rejoices. They started. And today you can start a brand new walk with the Lord. It may be confess. It, for some in here, it, you, maybe you've confessed your sins, but your word right now may be repent. Repent's a military word that means to do an about face. And maybe there's some things in your life you just need to turn away from and turn toward. Whatever it is. For those of you who are saved and you've repented and you're serving the Lord, maybe your word is joy. Maybe this year, God, you just need to focus on having joy. Put a smile back on your face. Quit watching the news and being so depressed about the world. Listen, God's on his throne. We're on his side. Everything's going to be all right. We're going to face battles. They have since Jesus came. Jesus was born right in the middle of political turmoil that was a lot worse than what we're facing right now, and they even killed him. And there may come a time, and there will come a time, according to the book of Revelation, where they're going to kill us if we're still here. But Jesus is going to be faithful to his people. So don't get all discouraged by that. Get joy. I just told you they may kill you if you, well, don't stay long enough to get there. Get saved. You won't have to worry about it. Amen. Let's go on the first load up. Let's be raptured out. Whatever your word is right now, program it in your mind. Stand to your feet with me this morning. And whatever that word is, 
I want you to ask God right now, Lord, give me that word, whatever it is. And the first thing that's coming to your mind, that may be it. This is what I, I need to do this year. Listen, I want to I start from where I just ended. If you're here this morning and your relationship with God is not where it needs to be, and you know, nobody knows like you know. You know where you are, but hey, it's a new season. It's a new year. And you can start right now in the small things. There's no, there's no need to weep over small beginnings. No need to be like Israel was and cry because it doesn't look like a completed project. God knows the end from the beginning, and he sees where you're going, and he rejoices over it because he knows if you can just get started that he'll take care of the end. So get up and get ready. Get started. Start moving toward him. So the first thing I want to do this morning is pray for those who need to come to the Lord and say, God, I need you to be Lord of my life. And if that's you, the Bible makes it very simple. It's Romans 10 and verse 9. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what it says in verse 13. Chapter 9, verse 9 says, If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. There's not a set group of words you have to pray. It's just saying, Lord, I need you. I believe that you sent your son. He died for me. I believe that he is God and that he died for my sins and I receive your forgiveness in my heart. If you'll do that right now, God will save you. He'll help you. And that's just a small thing. But God's going to make it a big thing because he's going to prepare a place for us that where he is, there we may be also. That's a big thing. And it starts right now with a small thing that's a big decision. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every person that's watching or hearing me right now, wherever they may be, in this room, outside this room, around the world. God, I ask you right now to forgive us of our sins. Lord, I ask for every man and woman in this room, God, that may be in a place where they know they need you. They know they can't do life without you. Lord, I ask you right now to turn it around. Lord, to put them on the path that they need to be on. God, we stumble, we slip, we fall, but you're faithful to pick us back up and to set us on the right track and to help us be who you've called us to be. So today, God, there's no judgment from you or for us, for anybody, but there's only grace, grace. Lord, you said that when the capstone was placed that they shouted, grace, grace. And God, today I shout grace over every man, over every woman, over every boy and every girl. God, help us to love them like you love them right now and to say you're forgiven. When you receive the Lord right now, folks, he's coming, he's going to take residence and he'll be with you and he's coming in right now. Just say, Lord, receive me as I come to you. And God, I receive you as you come to me. And I'm saved by the blood of Jesus. I believe that I'm on my way to heaven. And if you prayed that prayer and you believe that right now, I want us all to give the Lord a praise. And if you prayed it, I want you to give God a shout that God has forgiven you and you're on your way. Just turn around. Just keep marching to him. And I want to pray one more prayer, and I'm letting you go. I'm in Sunday school time. Father, I thank you for every person that's here today. And whatever that one word is, I pray solidify it. God, we're going to put it in front of us. God, we're going to put it on our, our mirror. We're going to put it on our steering wheel. We're going to remember throughout 2021 the word that you've given us, and we're going to be focused on it. And we believe, God, that small things make a big difference. And when we do what nobody sees, then everybody's going to want what everybody sees. You're going to bring the result in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Love you. You're dismissed. Have a great week.